There is a book that was published in 1964 called The Three Christs of the Ypsilanti. The book is based on a uh, psych psychiatric um, case study by uh, Dr. Milton Rokesh. Uh, he's a doctor that studies um, mental illness. And uh, Rokesh was um, treating three different patients uh, at a psychiatric facility there in Ypsilanti, uh, Michigan. And uh, these patients, they all suffer from delusions of grandeur. Uh, a, a common disorder, maybe some of you have heard of this before, but uh, each of these three men, what was so unique about them, each of them thought that they were Jesus Christ. This is what he's dealing with them in uh, this mental institution. And uh, the doctor worked hard on the task of um, introducing them to reality. He's trying to get a, a breakthrough. Uh, in his book, he, he, he tells about trying to convince these men that they really aren't God in the flesh. He goes on to tell about how that, uh, he had these, these three guys uh, that they lived together. They stayed in the same room together every afternoon that they would have a group therapy session together. Uh, all this continued on. And the doctor hoped that by spending time with others that thought that they were Jesus Christ, that it would help them uh, correct their situation. And uh, he had some very interesting conversations. One of the men would say, I am the Messiah, the Son of God, and uh, I was sent here to save the earth. And uh, the doctor would say, well, how do you know that? And he would say, God told me. Well, one of the other men said there, I never told you that. And so, you know, this is going on. And then the third one would get upset. And by the time that they all got through, there was a lot of chaos going on. And uh, the study showed that there was a lot of uh, um, sharp and angry things said in this study. And uh, each Christ would simply uh, assume that the other two were patients there in the mental hospital. And this is what he's dealing with. Sadly, the doctor wasn't successful in... Um, his attempts to try to convince these men that they were not God. Uh, they were trapped in this upside down reality where they thought that they were the center of the universe and that everything uh, was really about them. And so with that said, with that introduction, uh, on this sermon of the American Idol of me, we've been doing all these American Idols, the foundation of reality is one of your questions and write it in because it's very important to understand this that there is one God and we are not him. We're not God. You say, well, duh, pastor, I know that. But you know what? Sometimes we don't act that way. Sometimes we don't act that way because sometimes we act as if we're God. That everything in the universe centers around us. We act that way. Once it is established that there's one God and it's not us, there's a choice that I think that has to be made. And that is, that we know that there is the Lord God that is the master of all creation. And uh, we also know that there is the God of me, the pretender of the throne. Us pretending that we're God. So the question is, whom do we serve? Who are we going to serve? Are we going to be pretenders and act like we're God? Or are we going to look to the true and living God that he is, the, he is God, he is the creator of the universe? I think it's a very simple answer. Um, but yet, sometimes our lives don't show that. There are some symptoms that I want to start in the introduction of this message on the American Idol of me that edges, uh, if we're not careful, to the, the throne of our heart. We edge ourselves toward that way with these symptoms. And I would say the symptom of self-importance. What I mean by that, I'm always right. My way is the best way. Um, yours is not. I know what I'm doing. Uh, and the God of me won't listen to the wisdom of other people. Some people won't listen to anybody else. They refuse to listen. Those kind of people have a problem with the American idol of me. You know, I know what I'm doing. Do you know what George Gordon Liddy, I think most of, especially you older people, if you young people have studied American history, you will know uh, George Gordon Liddy was uh, uh, the Watergate conspirator uh, back in the 70s. But um, when he was released from prison, you want me to tell you what he said? 
He said, I have found within myself all I need and all I will ever, all I will ever shall need. I am a man of great faith, but my faith is in uh, George Gordon Liddy. I have never failed me. Now there's a man that's got a problem with the American Idol of me. And there are a lot of people like that. When was the last time that you made the statement, I was wrong? You were right. I should have listened to you. I like your idea better. You know, all these different things. I'll tell you what was running through my mind. You know, if you've never preached, I would tell you, there are all times that I, I can have two or three thoughts running through my mind at one time while I'm preaching. And I, you need to pray for me, you know, that God will help me be strong. I'm thinking, you know, on this, I'm going to be honest with you today. I should have listened to you. I'm, think, I'm hearing my wife say, stay off the ladder, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I won't be that high again, I promise, Okay. <laughs> I'll stay down. But, um, or I like your idea better. You know, these are things that, when was the last time that you said these things? We often think too more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Is that not true? I think we all do. We all think too highly. It kind of reminds me of the young woman that went to her pastor one day and confessed. She said, Pastor, I have to admit that I'm vain in my thinking. In fact, even this morning, I looked to, in, the, in the mirror and admired my beauty. And uh, the, the elderly pastor, he paused for a moment and he said, be at peace, my dear, to be mistaken is not a sin. <laughs> so it might have put her in a position where she needed to be. But um, the symptom of self-importance, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. You have the, the symptom of being self-conscious. And that is uh, the American eye of me is consumed with what other people think about us. The truth of the matter is, what he thinks about is the most important thing. And if, if, if our heart's right with God and, and what he thinks about us, if we're in tune with God, what difference does it make what everybody else thinks? But you know what? Hey, we all struggle with that somewhat. We all do, what other people think about us. You can't help but be self-conscious when your God is you and it's all about you. When you're thinking about you and wanting yourself to look good in front of other people and all that, what about defensiveness? How do we act when some contrary suggestion or some, some of the blandest criticism, uh, maybe constructive criticism that's directed our way, how do we act about that? Or maybe even make it a little bit more bold and say a personal attack comes our way. How do we react to these things? Well, when you're a God, you must be perfect and no one else could possibly be in a position to criticize you, you know? The audacity of them to think that they come and criticize me. I know what I'm doing, you know, that they would say that. So the God of me will make you lonely because you can't handle equals. Uh, I'll tell you what the God of me, and this is the problem in our world today, this is the problem in America, is that people can't handle authority. And you want me to tell you the reason why? They're eating up with the God of me. That's the reason why. But yet the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28, the Lord makes it very clear when he says, because thine heart is lifted up. And thou hast said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the sea. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And so the American idol of me is the most relentless I idol of them all. We've talked about a lot of idols, but in reality, the American idol of me can be the worst of them all because if, you're, if you've got that idol in your heart and your life, in reality, all the other idols will probably be there too. You'll find the symptom of self-centeredness. A recent study by five psychologists suggests that today's college students have a, a tendency to be more self-centered than what they have in days gone by. I think it's not only college students, I think that it's probably a lot, but it, I think probably it does fit with college students. From 1982 to 2006, their study says uh, 16,475 college students, they completed valuation uh, called Narcissistic Personality Inventory. That's NPI is what they call it. Narcissism is a term generally used for those who are very selfish 
conceited, egotistical people, particularly in regard to how people uh, relate socially. And so uh, those tested, they had to rate certain um, responses to statements that they read. They had to rate these. Statements such as, if I rule the world, it would be a better place. I think I'm a special person and I can live my life the way I want to. These different statements among many others. But uh, they say that the scores have been spiraling for years. And the study's leading author, Professor Gene Twinge of San Diego University, uh, San Diego State University, believes that we've gone overboard. And I think this is a very powerful statement we need to listen to, and especially you that are parents, but we've gone overboard in telling our children how special that they are when we should be showing them their responsibility to others. That's a statement she made. And I think that's a very powerful statement. And you know what? I think that as parents, we ought to let our children know that, they're, that they are special, but they're not special above and beyond, like they're special above everybody else in this world. Uh, they need to understand that we have responsibilities in this world. And, uh, uh, the doctor went on to say there was a, she told about a, a, a song being sung in a preschooler's um, class that said, I am special, I am special, look at me, look at me, you know? And uh, so we, we put so much emphasis there that we, we grow children up that think that everybody's got to look to them as if there's something special above and beyond everybody else. And, and truth of the matter, you and I know as Christians, we're servants, Amen. We're servants of the Lord. We are special to God, but we are his servants. The study suggests that narcissists are more likely to have uh, romantic um, relationships that are short-lived, at risk for infidelity, uh, lacking in honesty, uh, over-controlling, uh, violent behaviors, all these different things. But um, we're talking about symptoms here. And I don't, have any, I don't have more time to talk about that. And I want to give just two points to you in this sermon today concerning the American Idol of me. First of all, God's disappointment of the American Idol of me. If you would turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. The American Idol of me takes many forms, but hear me when I tell you that none of them satisfy. All through this series, how many times have I told you over and over again that these things in and of themselves are not bad, but they don't satisfy because there's only one who's meant to satisfy and that's God himself. We look to these other things to satisfy us and they don't do it. Well, there's an image in, uh, that is used in the Bible that captures what happens when we put ourselves on the throne of our hearts instead of God. And uh, this is a very strong image here in Jeremiah chapter two, Old Testament book. Jeremiah speaks uh, uh, here and makes this case to the people. And verse 9 and then verse 11 through 13, it says, Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horrified, be horribly afraid, be very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out histerns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, he summarizes the rebellion up here in two sins. Number one, they have rejected him, and instead, they have turned to worthless idols. Those are the two things that they have done. And he explains to the people that when we put ourselves on the throne instead of God, um, that they have rejected him and they have, uh, they have, we turn to worthless idols when we do that. But uh, he's saying here, it's like insisting that we drink out of uh, broken cisterns. When there's a, a fresh and flowing stream of water that's right next to us that we could drink out of here. That's what he's saying. Now, in this day and time, cisterns were a very important part of the day-to-day -day life there in Israel during uh, Jeremiah's time. In fact, uh, thousands of cisterns have been, um, have been dug up. They've been uncovered by archeologists there in Israel. Uh, you that have been there with us to Israel, uh, at the garden tomb, they have a cistern there. That was one of the reasons why they think that 
that might be the place that they laid the body of Jesus. And uh, even though you don't go in down there, you can, is huge. I mean, some of the sessions are going to be as high as this ceiling and uh, uh, underneath the ground there, you know, water. But they show you a picture, you know, there at the garden tomb, and you can see that this is down below you here, you know. And, of course, this beautiful garden that's all, all uh, above there. But rain was infrequent and scarce for half the year in this land. And so people in those days, they would dig their cisterns and they would um, line them with brick and then plaster so that they would hold water. And they'd have water down there. But cisterns were always breaking and losing their water. That was something that happened over and over again. And even, even when they didn't break, the water would become sometimes inadequate. They wouldn't have enough. There wouldn't be enough there. But if there was water there, many times it was stagnant. I mean, who wants to drink water like that? I mean, if it's all you got, it's one thing. But the people would uh, have, have thought that this metaphor that Jeremiah is giving is ridiculous. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, because why in the world would a person drink water out of a cistern when they have a clear crystal flowing water to drink from. It'd be kind of like, you know, going out here and uh, in this little pond we've got out here, this retention pond when it's got water in it and going out there and drinking the water when I'd say, hey, I just got this out of the refrigerator. It's a bottle of cool water. Drink this, don't drink that. No, nah, it's all right, I'm gonna drink out here, you know. I'm thinking, you know what, you're an idiot, you know. You're crazy, you know, why would you do that? But you know, that captures the ridiculousness of idolatry is what it does. We, cho we choose a broken well with stagnant water instead of the spring of living water. You see where I'm going? You see, I'm talking about Jesus being the living water. We choose all these things out here in this world that are stagnant, that are no good, and, and perhaps will do us damage and harm. Uh, why do we need that when we can have the Lord Jesus Christ? One of your statements here, we look for something or someone to do for us what God was meant to do for us. God was meant to do these things for us and we look to the world to do it for us. Instead of looking to God as our source of comfort, we turn to food and mindless entertainment uh, rather than looking to God in our time of uh, hardship. Uh, instead of looking to God as our source of significance, we turn to our careers, we turn to our accomplishments in this world. Instead of looking God to God for our source of security, we, we look instead to our money, we look to our investments of thinking that these things are going to take care of us in the future. Instead of looking to God as our source of joy, we look to our spouse, we look to our children. Instead of looking to God as our source of hope, we look to politicians and les legislation, God forbid. You know, we looked to our, our government. Instead of looking to God as our source of truth, we look to popular opinion or academic consensus. And that's what people do. All these gods that we've been talking about. These things that we look to for help, I've said it before, I'll say it again, that they aren't necessarily bad or evil in and of themselves. In fact, God may even use these things in order to accomplish his purpose. But the question is, are they broken cisterns that we turn to instead of turning to the living water? That's the question today. We all put our trust in the American idol of me and we become disappointed. And I think that we should ask ourselves, everybody ought to ask themselves this question today. Am I putting my hope in something that does not hold water? It's just gonna leak out. It's never gonna last. I think a lot of people do. I think we all have some time or another, have we not? In our lives, there might be some of you today that have your hope in things that just aren't gonna hold water. You're gonna be disappointed, I promise you, it's coming. You watch all the water come rushing in and then through, and though you've tried desperately to contain it, you can't do anything about it, it's just gonna slip right on out. You're not gonna be able to do it. And that's the reason why, said, that's the way some of you feel about your marriage today. You were in love and you were sure that it was gonna be a, have a happy ever ending, uh, ever ending. And um, you've been patching one leak after another and it seems to be beyond repair. Some of you might be there today. 
That's the way some of you may feel about your children today. You had such high hopes and dreams for them and you've done everything that you can for them. You have invested in them. And now there's this sense of panic because of the decisions that they are making in the direction that they're going. And where is it all leading? And you're wondering why could all this ever take place? How could this happen? Some of you may feel this way about your finances. You're looking forward to maybe a vacation or maybe uh, a retirement. You know, you've saved up and you, you think that um, you've put your hope in this retirement and you're looking forward to that. But you've watched your savings, you've watched your investments slowly drain away, and you know what? There went your hope. Because that's where you were putting your hope in. You might have been putting your hope in your, your marriage and your children and your finances and, and all these things of this world. But it's that moment when you realize what it, whatever it is that you put your hope in, it doesn't hold water. You realize that. It doesn't hold water. With panic and dread as you look on, it seems like there's nothing that you can do. And you know, that's where a lot of people in the world are today. They're hopeless. That's the reason why people are hooked on drugs and they're involved in a lot of things that they're involved in today is because they think that there's no hope in this world. Where am I going to turn to? They've turned everywhere. And this is one of your statements. It's a powerful statement. The God of me in all his forms always leaves you disappointed and disillusioned. Did you hear me? It always leaves you disappointed and disillusioned. So here's the question we're left with. Is there another hope? That's the question. Brings me to my second point, my last point of my sermon today. God's deliverance of the American Idol of me. If you're looking at John chapter 4, we studied this a year ago. You remember I preached on this particular story. But in John chapter 4, Jesus um, gave himself the title of the living water. All through the Bible, you'll find the water representing um, God. But Jesus is traveling when the Bible tells us that he had, he had to go through Samaria. You remember the story? He had to go through Samaria. But if you look at the map, you would think that's not entirely accurate when you look at the map. But uh, there's certainly ways around it. And most of the Jews would have done whatever necessary in order to stay out of Samaria. They didn't want to go there. You, and I don't have time to go into detail uh, concerning all that. I would just tell you that there was a lot of prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. But John says that Jesus has got to go through Samaria. And the reason why, there was a woman there that lived. She lived there and she was desperately searching for something or someone to put her hope in. This woman's a desperate woman in life. She's a, she's a, de a, a desperate person. Time and again, uh, she had watched the, the water rush out of her life. Uh, her search always ended in disappointment. I did not I'll tell you that if we look to the God of me or the gods of this world that will be disappointed, will be disillusioned. That was this woman here. When Jesus arrives in Samaria, he, he comes to a well and a well is different from a cistern. I think you know that. A cistern collects rainwater, whereas a well uh, allows you to draw water from underground or, or way down in the ground. But as with cisterns, getting water from a well required a lot of work. Some of you that are older and you remember those days when you had to go get water out of the well. I'm not talking necessarily about the kind you just pump, but I'm talking about the kind that you lower the bucket down and get water out of a well way down below. That's going back. Hey, if you go back that far, you go back pretty far. <laughs> I'm not gonna call any names there today, but uh, anyhow, some of you remember that, or some of you have seen those type of wells uh, and, and different places, and I've seen them. I didn't live in that day and time, but I've seen them. But um, so like cisterns, well, could be, it, could be, uh, it could be dry or it could be stagnant. The water could be stagnant. Here it is, you've got Jesus coming on the scene. It's about noontime that he comes to the well. In the heat of the day, no doubt I would tell you that Jesus is tired from, already tired from walking. He sits down to rest on the well. He's thirsty. But there isn't much that he can do about water in the well because it's probably 100 feet deep. In fact, I would tell you that I know that it was. And the reason why is because I've been to this well. Um, in our travels to Israel, 
only one time, I forget how many times I've been there. I think I've been there six or seven times. And, um, but one of the very first few times they took us there and uh, they've not taken us there since. And I've asked about it. They say it's a long way there, number one. Number two, it's a more dangerous area to go. And so they don't take groups there much anymore. But I did have the joy of going there one time and um, we dropped a coin down there and it seemed like it took forever before you ever heard that coin hit. Long way down. They say it's at least 100 feet deep uh, down there. And so Jesus has no way to draw water out of that. How, do you go, how are you going to draw from 100 if you don't have anything to draw with? His disciples, they run off to grab some lunch at a nearby village there. They leave Jesus alone there, leave him behind. And Jesus knew because he is God, he knew that this woman would be coming soon. And when she rises at the well to get some water, Jesus said, would you give me some water to drink? And so she does a double take because for this, number one, in this period of time for a man and number two, for a Jew to speak to a Samaritan was an astounding thing. And he asked, uh, and uh, number three, that he would ask of her of something, that I, I'm needy and I need something from you, that he would do that. But yet that's exactly what he did. She doubles a double take uh, of that he's speaking to her. And uh, so my guess at this point, she's thinking that the heat's getting to this guy. You know, what's, what's up with this? I, I don't get all this. So she points out to Jesus that you don't even have a bucket in order to draw the water from. Well, Jesus explained to her that if she drinks of his water, that she'll never thirst again. That's what Jesus says in John chapter four. And he has something that will satisfy her thirst forever. Now, I would tell you, we have a tendency to be able to uh, blow right on by stories like this because we're, most of us know Christ is our savior and we're reading back about it. But if you had put yourself in her situation in that day and time for a man just to come on the scene and make these remarks, uh, you would see it in a whole, totally different light. This woman, she's thinking that he's speaking about physical terms. That's what she's thinking that he's talking about. And uh, that Jesus was going to give her some type of physical water that she would never thirst again. So she has nothing to lose. She agrees to drink this magical water that this strange stranger has come on the scene to tell her about. So Jesus tells her to go back home and get her husband and then for them to come back together. Well, she tells him that she doesn't have a husband. And then Jesus, with a gentle smile, he says, you've spoken the truth. In fact, you've had five husbands and the man that you're living with right now is not your husband. At that point, she realizes that this is more than just a strange stranger. In her heart, she's beginning to think, this man's gotta be a prophet. There's gotta be, there, there, there's something unusual about this man, he's gotta be a prophet. And immediately, uh, she, uh, tries to take the spotlight off of herself by moving on to another subject. And I wish I had time to read all through this. She asks a theological question. And in verse 25, she says, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. And then in verse 26, Jesus says just very simply to her, I that speak unto thee am he. You're talking about the Messiah? It's me. I'm him. Can you imagine how that must have been? This is the only time that we know of in the entire life of Jesus that he voluntarily uh, revealed his identity. It's amazing in this one place. Imagine the moment for this woman. Her search had finally come to an end. She'd been looking all of her life, five husbands, the five different wells, they all, all of them leaked. None of them held water for long. She'd marry one, move on to another because it didn't give her what she was looking for in her life. It didn't give her the happiness, the joy and contentment and peace that she was looking for. But when Jesus comes along, when Jesus came and he revealed that who he is, there is something within her that knows that he's the one. Jesus is the one she has been looking and longing for. He's finally here. I finally found the one that I'm looking, I'm longing for. Today, I'll tell you that we are surrounded by thirsty people that are drinking from rails that never satisfy. Folks, you go on TV, man, can it get any worse? 
can get any worse than what we're seeing of uh, uh, the horrible things that took place in Paris this week. And it, it, this, this past week is Paris. Where's it going to be this week? What school, what university is going to be at this week? Uh, what person is going to come on the scene that has great difficulty and causes uh, grief and heartache for so many other families and people? Who's it going to be? I'm telling you, folks, this world is a thirsty world. They're dying today and they're looking for something that will give them peace and contentment and happiness and they're not finding it. It's wells that never satisfy them. My friend, I would say to you today, if you don't know Christ, you have to come to Christ and face yourself and realize that, we're, that men are sinners. Realize that this water that Jesus talks about is, a, uh, is eternal life, is freely given by our Savior to all who will believe upon him and uh, realize that they need to be saved. That's all you have to do. As the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I can't force you to drink, but I can tell you where the water is. And I also can tell you that the world will not satisfy your thirst, but will only make you thirstier. I can tell you that. Is that not true? It is. You know that it's true. Let me summarize some of the things that we've learned from this wonderful story. No one's too sinful to be saved. Amen? No one's too sinful to be saved. No one is so lost that the Lord cannot find them. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't make any difference, friend. God's not willing that any should perish. No one can be saved without facing his sinful past. No one who faces his sinful past will ever be turned away from our precious Savior. God loves everyone. And no one who meets Jesus will ever be the same again. John Starnes, I think, is the one that sang that song, you will never be the same again. Once you come to know Jesus Christ, you'll never be the same. God changes you, you're different. And I've, friend, if you're here and you're without Christ, Jesus is ready to give you the living water today. He will give you eternal life. It's free for the asking. And I ask you the question there, are you ready to receive it? I say to you, what a story, what a Christ, what a savior, what amazing grace that our Savior would love us, give us eternal life. You say, I don't know Jesus. I've never put my faith and trust in him. Let me tell you what you need to do today. It's on your little paper there on, on uh, your church paper, little tab that you're going to drop in the offering plate in a few moments. It has the plan of salvation. That plan of salvation, in reality, the sinner's prayer is we realize that we're a sinner and that, that Jesus loves us and he died on Paul and across the Calvary for us, all we have to do is call upon him. So we pray a prayer like this. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for me, that I can have eternal life. I'm putting my faith and trust in you today. Please save me from my sins. If you pray that prayer, you've never prayed that prayer before, you pray that prayer today, Check it down on that little list there as a testimony what you, that you put your faith and trust in Christ. There's nothing greater in all the world to do than put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians, has the devil fooled you into following the American idol of me? God longs for you to experience his living water. Like the illustration I gave out here of drinking out here in this, in this retention pond. You wouldn't want to do that. Man, you don't want to do that. But you know what? There are a lot of Christians that are living their lives that way. Jeremiah says the heavens look on with great horror. They look on with great horror at the sight of God's children drinking from those nasty cisterns. Why would God's people drink from that stuff? I'm talking about the world. Why would Christians want to dabble out in the things of this world? It doesn't satisfy. It just destroys them. They're rejecting the living water. They can have a living water. They can have happiness. They can have joy. They can have peace and contentment. It's one of the most heartbreaking things God the Father has to watch. Of these people that claim to be His people, but yet they're drinking out of the dirty cisterns. He's provided for and given His children what is pure and life-giving, and yet too many are rejecting it. I hope that is not a true of you today. If it is, I'll tell you, you need to turn back to Jesus today. It's not all about you. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. Our life is not about us. 
Our life is about Him. Our lives are to be lived for His purpose and for His glory. I think in any and everything that ever happens, even in an accident like I would have take place, uh, we're to use it for His honor and His glory. Praise His name. Look to God.